in February of 2015, after a total of 10 years of hard work and dedication, I had passed my doctoral defense, and I had a bright career ahead of me. And at the exact moment, I had everything I had worked for. I had to leave. And it devastated me, because for 10 years, I had neglected friendships, relationships, even myself in the relentless pursuit of my dream job. I had poured all of my sense of self, all of my worth, all of my direction into becoming an academic. And that is the heart of occupational identity and what it can look like when it's unhealthy. I know this because, as was stated, I studied occupational identity development. I had spent countless hours listening to research participants and sifting through data, writing about healthy and unhealthy habits and how they impact organizations, and yet I had never given my own a second thought until I had to leave my calling and I fell apart in a spectacularly epic way. Even with all of my highly specialized knowledge and the ability to be able to describe and explain what was happening to me and why, I was still there. I was still there feeling guilt and shame and pain and grief and feelings of immense worthlessness. Which is why I'm here today, to share my research and my experience, because whether you are in your dream job now or chasing it, everyone can benefit from understanding occupational identity. And I want you to have the tools to not only name it, but actively manage it, so you can build a healthier and happier relationship to work. But before we get there, let's take a step back and define the term. Occupational identity is a sociological term that serves two primary functions. The first describes our awareness of ourselves as workers. The second describes how we can form some parts of our identity around the types of work that we do. But it can do so much more than just describe. It can help us understand how some people use paid employment as a vehicle for connecting to and expressing their deepest values, the most important parts of their identities. And that is an example of strong occupational identity. There are a number of career fields that have been built on this sort of connection. I generally talk about them as mission-driven work, and most nonprofits, social services, or care work fit under the label. These jobs are hard. Emotionally, physically, intellectually, they typically require long hours, challenging daily tasks, low pay, and limited room for advancement. And yet these critical jobs require that someone keep showing up in spite of all of those obstacles. And so it becomes about the mission. This is particularly amplified in any kind of field that is addressing issues within our mainstream culture work ending gendered violence or institutionalized racism, fighting for reproductive rights or the legal equality for queer and trans communities. These types of jobs inherently require that a person be living out their most important parts of their identities or their core values, that you really are what you do. And that influences how you see others as well as how others see you. Which means occupational identity, even well managed, impacts every single part of the social experience. When I left academia, I had to figure out a new direction for my career, and all of my social circles had to shift. Friendships, colleagues, pools of potential partners, the people I saw day in and day out, all of it. So there I was, trying to figure out who I now wanted to be in life, as well as how I fit into the world around me. And so, being a true academic, I turned to my research and wanted to really understand what were the strengths, the benefits, 
and the risks that came with having such a strong connection to the occupational identity. And I have used that as a place to help both myself and others start building some of that healthier relationships to work. Let's start with the benefits because truly there are so many good things that come from having that strong connection to the work that you do. The first is that work is deeply and personally meaningful. There is a sense of special fulfillment, like you're really making a difference. This isn't to say that there are not bad days. There are plenty of them. What this does mean is that the feeling of pointless labor is mostly absent. One of my research participants best described this when she told me, every day I know why I come into the office and that my showing up counts for something. This feeling of meaningfulness also reduces some of the typical work issues we see, things like tardiness, absenteeism, or time wasting, because the sense of self is at stake. If we are our work, then we must do that work in order to fully express the self. Another benefit that comes from having work reflect your deepest identities, your most important values, is that you naturally want to work hard, do a good job, and care about the outcomes. Strong occupational identity results in highly dedicated employees who are willing to do an extraordinary amount of work without personal glory or gain. Mission-driven individuals are so deeply familiar with those long hours, that low pay, and building a wide skill set from fundraising to program management to light electrical repair. And they do all of that kind of work, all of that extra work, without extra compensation as a direct result of their connection to their occupational identity. The commitment to doing good work builds up the sense of self, and then that sense of self strengthens the work ethic and commitment. The last benefit that I'm gonna talk about today is that mission-driven organizations attract like-minded people, those with similar values and beliefs. This feeling of connectedness extends not just to colleagues, but to the organization itself feeling like you are part of a group who just gets it, whatever the it is, results in higher job satisfaction, the development of a robust social network, and a greater sense of well-being in other parts of life. It also results in higher organizational cohesion and achievement. One research participant consistently, and I mean consistently, talked about her colleagues as her family when we feel like we are part of a group of similar people, it meets a really basic human need. And those with occupational identity that is strong get to reap this reward daily. And it only further increases the positive connection between the work and the self. Now, that all sounds lovely, but as we know, every strength casts shadows, right? There are serious risks that come with having such a strong connection to the kind of work that you do. It's important to know them so you can manage for them. The first is that there is a large factor of exploitation of self or others. At the hands of others, it can look like a funder or a colleague using your passion to manipulate you or a supervisor who knows that you won't say no or that you feel like you can't have boundaries with. On the first day of a salaried job, my executive director sat me down and told me, if you clock less than 50 hours in a week, we're gonna have a problem. Now, I could have said no to this exploitation. However, I started to worry. Maybe I was being selfish. Maybe I wasn't really committed to the job. Maybe I didn't even really care enough about victim survivors of sexual violence if I didn't work all of those extra hours. So I engaged in the exploitation in order to reaffirm my own occupational identity. At the hands of the self, it can look like taking a job that doesn't meet your financial need. It can also look like not taking your paid time off, whether sick, or vacation, even though you have it. 
It can also look like ignoring your basic bodily needs like thirst or hunger for extended periods of time or neglecting your overall health and so much more. And we say that it's all in the name of the mission or the work or the cause, but in actuality, these are unhealthy occupational identity habits that are only serving to reaffirm the occupational self. Another risk is toxic work cultures. So shortly after the 50 hours comment, I was trying to, you know, like, like you do in a new job, feel it out and see if that really was the expectation. And I will never forget it. One staff member turned to me and said, it's all for victim survivors. Normalizing and justifying a culture of exploitation. Toxic work cultures are everywhere, and I mean everywhere. But in mission-driven fields, they become focused around identity and dedication. Countless research participants and colleagues in the years since have talked to me about either problematic coworkers or the intense pressure they feel to conform to unhealthy occupational identity habits in order to prove their commitment to their job or the work. These kinds of habits become toxic when they are routinely excused as just a sign of passion for the cause, when they are normalized within the organization, or at worst, when they become the ideal role model that everyone should be trying to achieve. Toxicity will only spread, and the organization will end up seeing low staff morale, low organizational cohesion, and very high rates of turnover. Because mission-driven organizations attract those like-minded people, even one person, one person's unhealthy habits can trigger shifts within the organization's culture as other people act similarly to try to reaffirm their own identities or their place within the organization. The final risk that I am gonna talk about today is burnout. Burnout is the inevitable result of an unhealthy connection to the occupational identity. I'm gonna say that again. I want this to sink in for you. Burnout is inevitable. When we talk about burnout, we generally mean um, that you're feeling a little down, you're feeling a little frazzled, you've been stressed at work for a while, but burnout is a very specific type of severe work stress that results in deep changes to a person's worldviews and emotions. It results in depression, detachment, cynicism, and long-term fatigue. It cannot be cured by self-care strategies. Not a good glass of wine, not a great workout, and not even a long vacation. It is serious. It is long-lasting. When a person works without proper management or an unhealthy connection to their occupational identity, they will find themselves burned out and unable to continue in a job function, in an agency, or in their chosen career field. Of course, okay, it's okay. It doesn't have to turn out that way, I promise. <laughs> the good news is that managing the occupational identity across the career span matters. So whether you are a student, you are starting or transitioning your career, or even if you're approaching retirement, the identity habits we cultivate now carry us forward. So let's talk about what you, as individuals, can do. Each one of you listening to me, right now, wherever you are, take a moment and reflect. How much of yourself, your values, or your worth do you expect to be expressed through work? If at any point during this talk so far you have had the thought of like, oh, yikes, or she is personally attacking me, <laughs> right? This is your moment. Take a step back. Literally, let's do it together. Take a step back and explore where you are most susceptible to occupational identity-related stress. Begin to cultivate some healthy habits and set some normal boundaries. There are so many ways to do this. This can look like only accepting a job if it will pay you a living wage 
and provide you a healthy working environment. It can also look like taking that paid time off or that sick time when it's appropriate to do so. It can be finding a group of good friends who will give you healthy and constructive feedback. It can be, I don't know, let's think together. It can be as simple as setting some boundaries with colleagues when you know that they're kind of unhealthy and how they're connecting to their occupational identity. It can even be turning your email sync off. Think about it right now. Do you have your email sync turned on for work when you're not at work? That's an excellent place to start a boundary because you are worth more than anything you will ever be able to produce for an agency, a profession, or a movement. So start to find small strategies where you can cultivate a boundary or a new identity habit. Now, for those of you who are in positions of power, leaders, supervisors, faculty, mentors, all the good habits I just talked about, you need, need to directly and intentionally encourage those good habits. And you have to immediately address and discourage the unhealthy ones you see. Build up an organizational dialogue that is focused on active reflection and management and write practices and, practices and policies that require the good habits we're talking about. As leaders, we must do right by our people. I mean it when I say they are truly our greatest resource. Managing the occupational identity in yourself, let alone in others, it's really hard. I'm just going to say it. It's really hard, OK? But the long-term benefits that you will see in the individuals with whom you work the agency that you work for, as well as the profession or movement you participate in, it's going to far, far outweigh the uncomfortable conversations that are certainly lying ahead for all of us. It's been just over four years since I made a career change. And I still struggle all the time despite loving the extraordinary and significant work that I get to do every single day with rad colleagues, I still wake up with a longing, an ache, a hole where my sense of self as an academic once thrived. To me, it is so beautiful and fitting to be standing on the campus where I decided my life would be devoted to academia. If anything has struck a chord with you in this talk, this is your sign to act. Your work, and this is a promise from me, okay? This is a true promise. Your work can be more than just a job to you. But you, you must be more than your work. Managing the occupational identity across the lifespan, it is not a nicety. It is an absolute necessity. So start right now. Think of one new habit you can start forming. Think of one boundary you can set. I mean it. Right now. Because you are worth it. Thank you.